November 1st, 2023 edition of the Urban League Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series, brought to you by the National Urban League. I'm your host, Kenneth L. Johnson, president of the Harlem, New York-based diversity recruitment firm, East Coast Executives. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. The Digital Career Success Series, DCSS, is a professional development series that helps members of our Urban League Young Professional chapters and other diverse job seekers develop new skill sets that will enhance their careers through digital platforms such as webinars, Facebook, and Instagram Live. The goal is to provide an opportunity for professional development right from one's computer. If you want to know more, please visit NULJobsNetwork.com. Today, we have a special Digital Career Success Series, Be Your Own Advocate, featuring D. McDougal, Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Capco, and Adrian Porter, founder of Mid-Career Mastery. Listen, if you're on for the first time or if you're a continuous visitor to the DCSS, drop where you're from in the chat. Let us know. Let's go. We're ready to go. D, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Excited to be here. Thanks Thank for that you. warm introduction. We are so excited to have you. Uh, a lot of people may not know this. I had the opportunity to meet you uh, a few months back here in New York City. You were waving the flag for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Always. Um, your organization, but for another organization that's dear to our heart, BYP. And uh, everybody just seemed to have such a great time. And I really had a chance to just lock in and, and learn a little bit about you. But please tell our audience about you and the work you do. Sure. So um, again, I'm Dee McDougall. I am based in North Carolina. I'm the global head of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, for CAFCO. Um, we can connect on LinkedIn later, everyone. But if you read my bio, you'll see that I talk about the fact that I have an occupation. I, my day job is something that I get to do that I'm very passionate about. And that's increasing access and opportunity for people from different backgrounds. Um, I came to my career in DEI from um, a career in financial services, commercial real estate, but mostly on the marketing and communication side. Uh, you'll also see that I'm 100% extrovert. I'm a people um, people loving person. Uh, and when I'm not working and championing uh, DEI, I love spending time with my family, friends, and I am a bona fide dog mom. So that's my life. Yeah, you're dropping new terms on me. Occupation. I've Occupation. never heard that before. Yeah. I love it. I love it. You know what? That that's probably the great a great segue to walk us into a person that's all about career mastery. We got Adrian Porter on the on the uh on the DCSS. Adrian, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, what's going on, brother? Hey, and ladies. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here, man. It's good. It's good to be here. And you know, I. I, anytime I can talk about accelerating career, helping others, adding value, like I'm all in. So I'm excited to be here. And we're excited to have you. You know, I uh, came across you as a professional and as a friend through the Black Men Excel platform. I know you tap right. in with, with our good friend, Alfred Edmond over there uh, at right. Black Enterprise. And, and, and just I've been watching the work you do. So we're excited to have you here today. Oh, man, I'm, I'm honored, excited, encouraged, uh, and just inspired to be here as well. All right, speaking of inspiration, let's jump into it. It's be your own advocate. So it's my understanding that that as we've we've had some conversations and we kind of came up with three pillars of transformation. So Adrian, I wanna I wanna lean in on you to kind of guide us and start us through these pillars. Tell us a little bit about this thought process. Yeah, my, my pleasure. So, you know, in the work that I do uh, with Mid-Career Mastery and through my speaking, uh, I'm all about like my lane is all about helping people, what I say in the middle, right? Now, the middle can be defined as mid-career. It can be defined as mid-life. It can be defined as you're in the middle of a career transition, um, no matter whatever your age. And so that is literally my passion, my mission is to help people in their middle, in the middle, get unstuck so they can thrive. And what I wanted to do, and I'm a framework guy, right? So it's my background over 20 years in marketing and corporate. I love frameworks. I love models because to me, they simplify and provide a roadmap for anyone that's willing to get from point A to point B. And so what I've done is my signature framework is called the malaise to mastery map. And malaise is being defined as you know, a point where you're feeling like you're stuck or you're not sure where you want to go. You just have this feeling. And but my point, my goal is to help transform that feeling from malaise into mastery. And I always like to say that mastery is not just a destination. You know, it's an ongoing journey of meaning and significance and by continuous learning and skill development, relationship building. And so what I've done is I created this framework, which codifies what I call the three pillars of transformation 
for getting unstuck and thriving in mid-career and mid-life. And, and I didn't create or come up with, you know, mindset or what does that mean, but I wanted to just codify the best practices. And so these three pillars are mindset, um, meaning, and milestones. And I'll just quickly unpack that and then we can dive in uh, myself and D and, and what those pillars mean. Um, it's particularly for the audience. And so I want to look at what are the best practices um, and what are the behavioral shifts that people can utilize to get from point A to point B. So the foundational pillar is mindset. And this really represents, you know, the foundation of getting unstuck. It's it's the mental shift from having a fixed mindset where you feel that you can't accelerate in your career, you can't get promoted, you can't evolve, to having a growth mindset. It's reframing and reimagining what does it mean to be in this point in your life and point in your career. If you're mid-career, early career, and you're feeling stuck, and you feel that you can't evolve as a professional, then let's reframe, reimagine, reshift that mindset. Again, having a growth mindset. And then meaning is the pillar, which is all about purpose discovery. It's about aligning your passion and your purpose into the work that's meaningful for you. And the seeking aligning, alignment also with your values and aspirations. And then the last pillar is all about milestones. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where I like to say that milestones are those uh, motivational markers of progress, right? It's those concrete steps, those goals to get you to that purpose path, to get you to that meaning. And so if you think about just biologically, mindset, meaning, and milestones, like head, heart, and the feet, right? First is all about the mindset shift, and then meaning discovery, and then putting action into place. And then we can unpack that with respect to advocacy, because across all pillars, to me, the connective glue is all about your relationships. And so you have to advocate for yourself. You have to form relationships. You have to get those sponsors and mentors on board while you focus on reframing your mindset, discovering your meaning, and establishing those milestones. Wow, I love it. D, I want to bring you into the conversation, but I, I, this may be a step or two back because I think you have an interesting story, and hopefully you don't mind me kind of putting you on the spot and allowing you to share. But you spoke about an occupation. Hmm? and I know that you weren't always working in the DEI space. You yeah. were doing something else, but there had to be a point where you said, you know what, this is kind of the thing that I want to do and I need to advocate for myself or at least find situations that will allow me to pursue it. Can you, are you comfortable speaking a little bit about that process? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, one of the, the biggest parts of this and, and we're talking about being um, your own advocate is being able to tell your own story. Um, I think in order to tell a story, you have to do something of substance to be able to articulate it, right? But for me, my path into DEI as my um, full-time day job really came from me finding ways to focus on diversity and access, um, no matter what my job was. So, you know, previously I worked in an industry that was mostly white, mostly male. We didn't have a lot of gender diversity. I worked in um, a bank environment that supported the startup ecosystem. And so, you know, my, my lived experience was that I had grown up in an environment where my family was one of only a few black families. I was always one of only just a couple of, um, you know, black students or an only black student in class. And so I was always used to being an only, but when I got into sort of the professional world and I started to look around, I started to ask questions as to why, why are we doing things the way that we're doing things? Why are we only recruiting at certain schools? And so really asking the questions, but being prepared to be part of the solution. So it wasn't just a criticism, it was asking for an opportunity to participate to help solve the problem that I'd identified. And so that's what started um, sort of me identifying that problem, speaking up, asking questions, asking to be put in rooms, that afforded me the opportunity to get that experience that then built into my occupation. So my day job was more around marketing and communications, but what I was doing offside of desk or what I was doing in my volunteer roles really did create the building blocks for my career um, in DEI. And so as I started to talk more about the work that I was doing, both externally and internally, started establishing relationships with mentors internally who could speak about my work when I wasn't in the room. I had to give those folks the nuggets um, that they needed in order to um, you know, sponsor me, to champion my work. And then when an opportunity presented itself, they came to me and said, hey, D, will you do this? And so you know, my path into DEI was not that one day I got a job 
And, um, you know, I was given a job. It started before that with me doing the work, expressing my interest, telling my story. And then when the opportunity presented itself, I was ready. And so that's how I transitioned from, you know, doing something off the side of my desk to it being what I was able to do full time. And so, you know, as um, Adrian talked about mindset, right? So if we think about transitioning from sort of that fixed mindset to growth mindset, you know, I'm capable of doing everything that I need to, I just need the opportunity. And in order to be able to have that opportunity, I need to tell people that I want it. So that's what, um, and we'll talk through what communication, um, what effective communication looks like. But one of the things I really want to underscore is in order to tell a story, you have to have something to talk about. And that something to talk about is the work that you're doing. Wow, I love it. Adrienne, you know, uh, you know, speaking, just D speaking about how she set up the foundation to advocate for herself, just to me leads us right into the conversation about meaning. So yes. in your in the three pillars process or the mindset, where's meaning come in? Tell me a little bit about us. Tell tell us a little more about kind of what meaning is in this in this whole equation. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and, and and I like to say that these pillars, while they're you can attack and observe and dissect each one based on where you are in your career, I like to like to look them as sequential if you possibly can, because in order to to focus on and aligning and discovering and defining a meaningful career or a meaningful life, you have to, as Dee mentioned, you have to reframe your mindset. You have to go from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And to me, meaning again, is the heart of transformation. It's literally the point where, for example, like myself, you know, in the 20 plus career I had in corporate, when I left corporate and now I'm doing uh, the things that I do as an entrepreneur, as a speaker, as working with companies, I had to take a step back and really figure out what is my purpose path. And that's what meaning is all about is literally defining what is me, what defining, what does a meaningful career look like for you? What is your purpose? And a lot of times people try to understand, well, how do I even define or discover what is my purpose? And this is what I always like to tell people far too often. And this part, this is part of mindset. When we get to a certain point of our career, if we're looking to either pivot or evolve in a certain role or just try something new, a lot of times we don't think that the skills and the experience that we have in the past will align with what we want to do moving forward or align with a purpose driven career. And I always like to tell people, you have to connect the dots, always connect the dots, everything in your life, everything in your career, the relationships you've established, the experiences you've had, those dots can connect you to a meaningful life, a meaningful career. And things that you've done in the past, for example, I spent many years working in corporate for media companies, I worked for HBO, I worked for Cartoon Network, I was a, a marketing director, marketing executive. My role was to motivate people through storytelling to watch a certain program on television, whether it was The Wire or Soprano, Sex and City at HBO, whether it's Ben 10 or Star Wars at Cartoon Network. As a marketer, my role was to motivate individuals. I use those transferable skills today. I connected those dots. Back in my early 20s in Memphis, Tennessee, growing up, I used to speak a lot at my church, you know, and, 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 and do a lot of events at church or do a lot of speaking. I reached back, connected those dots. For anyone that's listening, the way that you accelerate a meaningful career and find meaning in what you do is that you go back and you connect those dots. What are some of those magical moments where you've shined, where people said, that you were adding value, where you were in your flow and figure out what were you doing at that moment? What was the value that you were adding? Look back at your skills and experiences that you've attained, connect the dots, and then you would be able to discover at least have more clarity on meaning. That is again, purpose is going, shifting from a career, of, a career, excuse me, of just thinking about success to thinking about career significance. And I'll repeat that shifting from just success to significance. And all of us are able to do that. And that is essentially at the heart of what meaning is as far as that pillar. Man, that's excellent. I appreciate yeah. that. Urban League Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series. Uh, please, if you have questions, leave them in the Q&A. There will be a Q&A segment where we'll have Adrian and Dee answer some of your questions. Dee, come on in. Yeah, so I was actually gonna just follow up on um, what Adrian said around flow. You know, I think that sometimes people don't, um, they don't lean into what feels good and what they're good at doing at work. And what, what I always counsel people on is that sweet spot for you professionally is where you are 
really good at the thing that interests you, right? And um, kind of comes naturally to you or you don't have to work as hard at. I can do spreadsheets. I can mine through pivot tables in Excel. That's not my sweet spot. My sweet spot is people. My sweet spot is speaking. My sweet spot is writing. So for me, flow comes when I look back, um, as Adriana was saying, around connecting the dots, when I look back on the things in my career that have helped me feel fulfilled, have helped me feel like I was in my zone, those are the that's those are the moments when I was operating in my gift, right? And I think that sometimes when we think about career and we think about success, we define success as you know how much money we make, and really. If you have to work really, 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 really hard or you work against your gifts in order to make all this money, that's not necessarily the sweet spot. The sweet spot is when are you in flow? When are you able to use the gifts that you have in a way that help you feel successful? And often, also, when we think about purpose and meaning, sometimes people think of this as like an altruistic thing. They think that it has to be in a mission-driven organization or that you have to be... Um, you know, working in a nonprofit world um, in order for your career to have meaning or purpose. And that's not true either. You can work in corporate um, and have a, a high paying role and it has nothing to do with sort of necessarily making the world a better place, but it's what you do with that gift that you have um, that can give you meaning, right? So I think sometimes the notion of meaning or purpose People can kind of get lost in it, but they don't give enough credit to what flow actually means when we're talking about the gifts that you have and the work that you do. So Adrian, I don't know if you have anything else that you can offer around that, but just, I think people, if you can find that sweet spot, my sister, she is a beast at Excel spreadsheets. She does not enjoy working with people as much as I do. So she is the Excel person. I am the words person, right? So that's what flow looks like between the two of us. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> So Adrian, Adrian, I know Dia wanted to know if you wanted to chime in on some of that, but um, I see a question in the Q and A. They want to know what that M stands for on your lapel, sir. So if you can share that, <laughs> uh, that's a great. Uh, that's what I call the mastery mark. So uh, it's 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 for mastery. It's for mindset. It's for meanings. For milestones. It's for malaise to mastery. I'm a marketer, so it's very flexible. But it's the it's the it's mid career. It's the mastery mark. I love it. So, so as 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 Dory and our crack team behind the scenes would have it, there was a question about defining mindset again, and we're on that slide. So let's walk into that. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me? Yeah, I can unpack. So mindset again, it's the foundation of getting unstuck. It's the foundation of thriving. It's the foundation of accelerating your career. A lot of times, we are, and Dee mentioned this earlier too. We embrace a fixed mindset based on a variety of reasons, whether it's through failures, whether it's through um, our environment, you know, we don't think that we can get out of this, whether it's a funk or whether it's a, a period of stagnation. And it's reframing, reimagining, what does it mean to be in this state of my career? What does it mean to be mid-career? What does it mean to be having 20 plus years of experience and you can't connect the dots? Mindset, again, it's all about going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. It's about going to a learner's mindset. It's about going to a skill development mindset. It's the foundation, it's the head. It's reframing, reimagining, what does it mean to grow? You, again, you have to get rid of the clutter before you have clarity. So all those existential questions that we tend to ask ourselves, right, in certain periods of our career, you know, is there a new job for me? You know, am I able to attain new skills? Um, is this, is this role the only role that I have in my life? Um, can I switch to a different, totally different industry? We ask ourselves these questions, especially when we go through this period of career malaise or ennui. And so mindset is all about first taking a step back, reimagining what does it mean, connecting those dots from your purpose path and even your pain to your purpose, um, reframing, rethinking, we're now living longer as a society. I talk a lot about this in the work that I do with Asian diversity. You know, we're now embarking on the era of the hundred year life, where before when we were looking at retiring in age 65, that's no more. People are working into their sixties or seventies or eighties. So if you're a 30 plus professional, or even a 45 year old, or no matter whatever your age, just reimagine, rethink that your career runway has been extended. You can possibly have two or three different careers and two or three different careers that's aligned more with something that's meaningful for you. So that's literally what mindset is. It's the foundation 
of thriving. It is a foundation of getting unstuck. It's reimagining and resetting your goals and, and your path to success in your career. I appreciate the definition. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. But I want both of you spoke about storytelling. Yes. And I'd really like to kind of take a dive into that. I think people people know the term, but they may not understand it in the the meaning that it needs to be understood as far as works is concerned. So can you guys speak about storytelling in the workplace and how that can advance your career? Dee, I'd like to start with you, please. Sure. So I think one of the things we have to um, become comfortable with is the fact that um, self-promotion is okay. Self-promotion is, is, is necessary. I think for a lot of us, um, we were raised to not be braggadocious. We were raised that, you know, if we do hard work, if we do what we're supposed to do, if we execute with excellence, people will take notice of that work and our work should speak for itself. And that's just not the way um, that things um, happen in the workplace for a number of reasons, right? We don't have to get into all of the reasons why, but just accepting, number one, that self-promotion when done well and with tact is okay. So if we accept that and then we say, okay, what does that mean? Well, storytelling is a powerful tool when we think about how to make people aware of our accomplishments and our efforts in the workplace. And so we say, okay, Dee, well, what does that mean? It means that your boss, it means that your colleagues, other success partners may not know everything that you do um, and the impact of the work that you do. This is not about listing out the things on your things to do list, but this is about articulating the value that you're bringing to work every day. It's about helping people understand the impact of the work that you do and doing so in a way that connects the dots for people and humanizes you. So when we think about storytelling, this could be something um, beyond your mid-year or annual review. This could be an update meetings with your, with your boss to be able to you know, just share what's been going on. It could be a problem that you identified and how you solved it. It could be as specific as how much money you save the company or how much time you save the company. This could be the number of referrals that you've brought in. This is These are the ways that you keep all of your colleagues, supervisors, and other stakeholders, or what I would call success partners, you keep people up to date on what you're doing. Doing so in a very authentic way is the most important part as well, like being able to weave it into regular conversations as well as you know just the scheduled report out. So when we think about the importance of storytelling, it really is around getting comfortable with the fact that you need to be able to tell your own story at work, right? And that it's okay. And that that story should be full of the ways that you've um, impacted or influenced things that happen in your business. And um, we can talk through sort of the mechanics of how to do that. But I just want to start with the, the from the place of telling your story, um, amplifying your successes is, is your own personal responsibility. I love it. Adrian, let, let's talk about meaning in that context. Like, how, how does that come it through? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can talk about storytelling all day. I mean, it's, you know, as humans, we gravitate towards stories. You know, we, since we were little, when, since we were babies, the way we go to sleep, you know, we love to hear beginning, middle, and end. We love to hear, hear about narrative because it frames, you know, many things in our lives. And what I always like to say is that, you know, when you are crafting and discovering, you know, purpose in your work, purpose in your life, which a lot meaning having a meaningful path, the way to, to accelerate that purpose path to accelerate you having a meaningful career is having your story, as Dee said, told, not just by yourself, but for others to tell your story as well. Mm -hmm. It's far too often, we just put the onus on us. And if we, we have to control our narrative, but the way to also control your narrative is to ensure that other people are telling your story that the way that you want it to be told, right? And storytelling, you know, we think about the greatest stories in the world. You know, we think about whether it's Star Wars or whatever the case may be. Um, there's always conflict, there's resolution, there's a hero. And all of that is can be aligned with your own career. When you're telling your story or other people are talk, telling your story, for example, projects that you've started, that you were successful, teams that you've put together, even though you may not have been on the front lines, you were responsible for coalescing the people to, to put on this team to make a project successful. 
your past job experiences, when you're in front of someone who's looking to possibly hire you, you're telling the story when you were successful, conflict resolution, when you face challenges, your personal stories, you know, about your family, you know, the things that, that, that light you up. That's part of meaning as well. A lot of times as people, we just don't want to hear about the profession. You know, we connect pe with people based on personal, personal relationships. Yeah. So please ensure that your story is a great mixture of you know, your personal successes and even some of your fa failures and lessons learned, but also what's meaningful for you just as a person. And so again, conflict resolution, characters, heroes, villains, like all of that can be communicated in the story that you tell about your career as a professional. And again, going back to this, you wanna make sure that the narrative of your career is being, is congruent with the narrative that you want to be out there. And the way that you do that is that you have to make sure that you have, you, know, you keep your ear to the ground and you develop great relationships, which would be a great uh, segue to relationships because the, the way yeah. that you ensure that your story is being told the way that it should be told is that you have to solidify those great relationships with individuals and 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 put feet to, feet to the fire to make sure that they're going to tell your story the way that you want it to be told. Man, yeah. that's a that's a workforce strategist for you right there. I love it. I love yeah. the way you laid that out. Hey, listen. So so we had someone in the chat and they were asking uh, probably something that's directly related to this. How do you identify? and basically secure a sponsor. You were speaking about the stories that other people are saying and sharing about you. And that's kind of the definition of a sponsor, especially someone that's speaking about you in rooms that you're not in. Yeah. How do you find and identify and secure that person, D? Yeah, so I think that, you know, sponsorship is really an important one to, to take note of because you don't really identify a sponsor. A sponsor identifies you. And the way that that sponsor identifies you is, is through the work that you do and how you show up in your personal brand. So, you know, a sponsor is very different from a mentor, right? So a mentor is somebody that you can go ask, you know, inside or outside your company and ask that person to sort of guide you. And it can be a resource for you, someone you can bounce ideas off of. Um, they're not necessarily putting their um, relationship capital or anything else on the line for you within the organization. It's, it's a relationship that may not have any sort of outside investment, right? It's not costing them anything. A sponsor is something totally different. So the way you earn a sponsor is how I would I would articulate it is you do really good work. You're seen as reliable. You're seen as somebody that if I put my name on you, you won't disappoint me. You won't let me down. And so I think that the way you earn that is by um, telling your story, right? Expressing interest in growing your career, um, be willing to do the work, um, showing that you are, you know, both grateful for opportunities and interested in learning and growing. And so it's really all about your personal brand. And are you known internally as somebody that gets the job done? Because if I'm going to put my name on someone, right, I'm only going to do that if I know and I have confidence in that person's ability to execute. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect, right? So one of the one of the um, examples that Adrian gave of powerful stories is, how did you course correct when you got it wrong? Or what does conflict resolution look like to you? But I think the way you earn a sponsor is to show up and do the work and indicate that you want to do more. Hey, D, yeah. there's, some interest, there's some interest in a deep dive here, and I'm going to keep you here. Sure. Yeah. One of the questions in the Q&A is, D, would you give an IRL example of telling your story? So in real life, would you give a real life example of you telling your story? Oh, this is... Uh... Of course, you ask the extroverted person to give a, and well, somebody has to ask me a question about so I can answer. Um, but I keep on standby just a few different examples of, you know, me telling my story, me telling the story about, you know, the occupation, me mentioning that I'm a dog mom, me mentioning that I'm an extrovert. That through my introduction today, you've learned more about me um, than just where I work and what I do, right? I think also there are examples that I could give around how I got it wrong. Um, so I think it, it varies. It's hard to be put on the spot for how you tell your story because I think it, it is situational. It depends on the context. But if someone wants to pop a question in the chat, I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, but I do think also to the point around authenticity and relationships, and we'll I'm sure we'll dive in a little bit more to this as well, but relationships at work are what matter most. 
you really need to invest in the relationships that you have with people at work for a number of reasons. It could be because you want someone to sponsor you, you were looking for a mentor, you were looking for additional um, opportunities at work. It also could be that when you leave that organization that you're a part of, you want to be able to lean on your network that you've established to be able to go to the next company or to get a referral for future business. So those relationships really do matter a lot. And people connect with people who have similar lived experiences or similar interests. So the more that you can talk about the things that are of interest to you, as Adrian mentioned, whether it's your favorite you know, superhero or your sports team or the fact that you go to the same dog park or whatever the things are, the more you're able to humanize yourself at work, the deeper those relationships will be, right? No one's saying you have to be best friends with your coworkers, but being able to establish those relationships does go a long way. And those are the people that'll be telling your story on your behalf when you're not in the room. Let's go to the next slide. Adrian, I want to bring you in here real yeah. quick. Uh, so uh -huh. we can talk about Milestone. Yes. Yeah, you want me to just unpack it a little bit more? So milestones, again, that's where the rubber meets the road. So after you kind of reframe your mindset and, thought and think and go from fix to grow, that you can change, you can evolve, you can accelerate in your career, you can thrive. And then you look at, well, what is the shift that you want to make? You know, this is what a meaningful role looks like for me. This is where my purpose path, how it's laid out. Now let's set some tangible goals. Let's set some both micro milestones and macro milestones, right? And a lot of times I like to say this, you know, when we get to a certain age state in your career, whether we're in our 30s or 40s or 50s, you know, prior to that, we have a lot of external milestones that are established, right? You know, we graduate high school, uh, we may get our first job, we may go to college if we choose. Um, then later on in life, you know, significant milestones, you know, you may retire, you have grandkids, you know, you settling in. But in that middle, I like to say that it's like one long run on sentence, right? No periods, no intentional mm -hmm. milestones that we establish or we're establishing and 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 achieving milestones that are through others right through our family but we don't take the time in the middle of our careers where we're busy when we're focused on progress that we take time to take a step back and establish what are those motivational markers that are going to get me from point a to point b that's all about establishing milestones whether it's taking time to upskill reskill be skilled based on a new position that you want to achieve so um, going to taking classes, taking courses, getting a coach, um, setting goals, personal and professional, running a marathon, learning to play the piano. Again, milestones is where the rubber meets the road. It's about setting those actionable, tangible markers of progress and momentum to help you realize meaning, to help you realize a purpose path. And not just establishing those milestones and goals, but taking time to celebrate them. So when I talk about the three pillars, a lot of times I talk about, for example, my mindset is about reframe and reimagine. Meaning is about discovering and dedicating yourself to that purpose. And milestones is about establishing and creating and celebrating. Because far too often when we set goals and milestones in our career, career milestones, even personal milestones, once we achieve those milestones, especially as busy professionals, you know, we should celebrate. Again, it doesn't have to be grandiose parties or what have you, go all out and rent out, you know, a Harlem ballroom. It can be something simple as take yourself to lunch, go out with a friend for a drink or a coffee, you know, just signifying the moment when you've won, big or small, because what that does, it reinvigorates, you know, levels of achievement, especially as a busy professional. And so again, milestones is where the rubber meets the road. It's about establishing goals, getting you from point A to point B and staying on that purpose journey, those purpose paths as far as progress and momentum. Yeah, you know, can I hop, in? Can yeah, I hop in here real quick? So one of the things that I'd also like to add is that we can be, um, we can be so focused on what's next that we don't acknowledge what is, right? And yes. a lot of times growth, we always think it's of growth as um, getting to the next rung on the ladder. But in your career, and Adrian, you said this, you know, because, and when I think about it, it kind of makes me sad, right? Like I thought when I was younger, I thought that when I got to my 40s that I'd feel closer to retirement, but it still feels very far away just because of how long folks are working. But exactly. with that, we think we have to be going up, 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 up all the time. And we don't give ourselves space to grow outward. We don't really give ourselves space to learn new skills or to get on another track and, and still consider that to be growth. If it isn't an upward trajectory, we, we think it's we think we're a failure, we think it isn't valuable. 
And one of the things about career is that you could spend time in, in the same space, if you will, and you could learn a new skill or you could transition to a different industry and be at the same level, but it's still valuable. And so I think that we, when we're thinking about how to define success or how to define meaning, we need to really take a holistic view of our career and what we want and not get so caught up in what's coming next, um, especially if it's not on um, you know, the, the next rung of the ladder. And I think that's where we just, we, we reach one thing, we're like, what's next? You know, we get a raise and we're already thinking about, you know, how much more money we're going to make on the next round. And you're right. We don't pause to take ourselves out to lunch or even acknowledge the accomplishment, even though this is what we've been working towards. So I think that's one of the things that we have to do as professionals is to give ourselves space to learn and grow, even if that growth doesn't mean achievement as far as the next rung on the ladder. And, no, and, no. Ken, I can't, and Ken, I just want to amplify a couple of gems um, that Dee just mentioned too, because I think it's worth reinforcing with respect to growth, not just being upward progression, but being outward. And, and far too often, you know, especially now, we have to, this is part of mindset, redefining and reframing. We have to reframe what does a career look like? And we're moving, as, as Dee mentioned, from a upward ladder progression type of career that's meaningful to something that's more of a portfolio career, portfolio yeah. growth, expanding. For example, as she mentioned, you know, you can be working in our job, but also you can start upskilling and reskilling and attaining new type of skills. And what I, I like to call skills superpowers as well. You are expanding your knowledge set. You are expanding opportunities. And again, it doesn't have to be going from mid-manager to manager of people to VP to C-suite. You may not want to achieve that type of C-suite role. That may not be for you, but you still can grow if you attain a new skill. You still right. can grow if you develop new relationships. And so, and I love the fact that she said that it was worth reinforcing again, that growth can be um, outward and doesn't have to be up the ladder. And then going back to storytelling too. Again, I love that Dee said, you know, you have to tell your story in all the different assets of your life. That's storytelling because someone asked, how do you tell your story? For me, I t people know after watching a couple of events that I do or listening to my podcast, like I always ask the personal theme strong question when I'm facilitating a panel or when I'm interviewing people. I ask guests, you know, if there was a song that would play whenever you walk in a room or on stage or down the street that perfectly captures your brand, What's your personal theme song? The reason I always ask that, because number one, I'm a music junkie, right? Music is my blood. People know that. That's part of my story. And also music is a universal language. So we all can relate to music. That is storytelling at its finest. And so part of storytelling, the way that I tell my story is infusing those passion points of music into everything that I do whether it's the personal theme song question, whether it's when I'm writing a book, I have music lyrics in, on each chapter. That's part of my story is I'm Adrian. Yeah, I do this and I make career mastery, but I'm a music lover and people know that. And that's part of my story. Right. I love it. You know, D, D I want to come in because uh, I'm, I'm seeing this question in Q&A, but I think you touched on it and I want you to kind of uh, speak to it again. So the question is, what suggestion do you have for someone looking for a sponsor and it's their first 90 days in a new position. Yeah. Um, don't put your head down and do the work, but do the work, right? Establish relationships without um, asking for anything in return, right? So you you go on that internal roadshow um, within the company, make connections, um, meet people without an agenda, just make yourself visible and accessible while also executing against whatever that 100 day plan is, right? So your personal job is to meet as many people as possible. Hopefully they're senior to you, but to do so in an authentic way, right? You're not going on a tour to ask someone to sponsor you, but you are being intentional about establishing these relationships. And then on the other hand, it's doing what you were hired to do, um, knocking that out of the park, because that's what people will see. That's what people will talk about. They'll say, I'm not sure the name of the person who asked, but they'll say, you know, man, you know, Ken just started in this role a couple of weeks ago. They've already knocked out their onboarding checklist. They've already raised some great points and some meetings. So be known and start to be known for your work and how you execute with excellence and then start working those relationships so that people can connect the dots. So really sponsorship is earned. It's really you doing a good enough or great enough job that people are willing to speak up for you in a room full of their peers. 
that's what I would say. First 100 days, knock the work out of the park and establish those relationships. Internal road show. I love it. Talk that talk. That's that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, look, we're going to jump into questions. This is the Urban League Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series. Uh, Adrian Porter, D. McDougal, here to answer your questions. I'm going to start out with this one. It's very general. Uh, advice for 25-year-olds. Either of you can jump in. Wow. Uh, advice for 25 year olds would number one, know that as, as, as we talked about earlier, runways are getting longer. Um, so know that that's, that's at your advantage. I would say start just developing really strong relationships, you know, from the beginning, no matter whether you're 25, 35 or 45, you know, all the relationships that you're nurturing and cultivating right now at this season of your life, as you for the past I guess three years or so entering the job market, especially post pandemic where everyone is still trying to figure it out, develop great relationships and also look at those pockets of opportunities where you can add value to others, right? You, you know, as a 25, I remember when I was 25, it seemed like years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I remember a lot of the mistakes that I've made. And I remember one of the biggest mistakes I didn't focus enough on developing great relationships and adding value to others. And last thing would be embrace those superpowers that you have as a 25 year old. I'll talk a lot about with age diversity, mutual mentorship, right? You know, seasoned professional, older person mentoring a young person, but also there's a lot of skills that we can learn as a 50 plus person from a young person. So 25 year olds, you know, you have your pulse on new, the latest digital technologies. You know, you have the fresh perspectives of youth. Use that to your advantage, communicate, tell your story, help others, nurture relationships, develop those skills. And that's my, my advice. Again, take this opportunity to learn as much as you can, cult, cultivate great relationships and add value whenever you can. And then you would see those rewards, you would reap those rewards and you will by nature be able to have sponsors hopefully lined up to talk about you when you're not in the room. You know, I know both of you uh, uh, probably would, would lean on the extrovert side of things, but there's a question about uh, someone who's an introvert, right? And the question basically is, how does someone get out of that particular mindset when they're networking and they want to be genuine? So if you guys can can kind of touch base on that, maybe through a learned experience or something of that nature, how do you suggest that one kind of makes that shift from introvert to just being genuinely interested in someone while networking? So I would say now, you know, know thyself is really important. So I am 100%, you know, extrovert as I have taken disc assessments and other personality profiles. There's no denying my people loving ways, right? So I recognize kind of who I am. I would say that for my colleagues that that are more introverted, right? Or it requires more energy for them to want to or be able to engage with others is to, and I have really close friends that are this way, rest up, right? Store your energy before you go out and have to, you know, be on. I think that's really important, right? You recognize that you're going to have to store some energy up to go do the people thing. Then engage in a way that's authentic for you, right? No one is expecting you to put on a whole different face when you go out and network, do what's most comfortable for you. So maybe it could be, you know, <clears throat> you put together your, your personal talk track of the things that you want to connect. Maybe uh, success looks like for you meeting three or four people as opposed to 10. Do what's most comfortable. Um, also, connecting on LinkedIn, right, is a great way leveraging your extroverted uh, connections. Um, maybe you have a, a wing person that you attend events with uh, that could be willing to, to be the person to go up to um, other folks. And then you tag along for those introductions. And then you could do, um, you know, follow up on LinkedIn or other social media sites as well, or email communication. So I think um, for my colleagues who are more introverted, what I never want people to feel like is they have to set themselves up to be someone that they aren't, but leverage the tools and resources that are available to you. So do what feels comfortable, prepare yourself by storing energy, have your talk track and have a wing person that is willing to do the heavy lifting so that you can kind of, um, you know, benefit from that relationship as well. So those would be tactics that I have seen work um, in real life. Um, and I'm always happy to be somebody's wing person if needed. 
D is the wing person. That's a strong person. That's a strong group right there. I love it. You know what? I, I started laughing. I looked at this question and uh, we're going to touch it, touch on it. I'm not sure in relationship to advocacy, how this plays out, but it's how do you build relationships with people that you don't like or care for on the job? Uh, Adrian, <laughs> I know you're the workplace strategist. <laughs> how, do you, how does one handle that situation, sir? Yeah, uh, well, I'm sure we all been through through that situation. Well, first, you have to look at again meaning. What is meaningful for you? Is is, is meaningful for you to be able to to keep your job so you can put food on your table, um, to continue to work in the work that you do? If you do that, you have to work with people that you don't like somehow, and to see at the end of the day what is the end result. So the way that you approach that is to try to separate out the personal feelings. Um, first, try to define what is it about this person that you may not like, right? Because so, far too often, maybe there are moments where there's a, a reason that you don't like this person and it may not be a good enough reason. Maybe there's something hindering, getting in the way of you opening yourself up to this individual. Um, now they could just be a bad person, right? And so you may have to deal with that. But I would say in those situations, Focus on doing great work, try to get past the reasons why, or try to define what is it about this person you don't like, and really look at the relationship they have with you. For example, if this person that we're referring to is your boss, this is your boss, and that person, he or she controls you know, your paycheck and controls whether or not that you're going to stay in this role, you have to then try to use as much power as you can <laughs> to think about, well, is it is it incongruent of me to try to ruffle feathers with this person because I don't like them? Or is it beneficial to me because I need to continue to go on the path that I need to go? And so again, I think it's, it's really looking at it micro level at, at the end of the day, what does this relationship mean for me? If it's a boss relationship or it's a teammate relationship to get me from point A to point B and then just focus on doing what you can to get past it and then go from there. But I've, I've been in those situations a few times. Like all of us probably have had bad bosses. Uh, we've had bad teammates or bad colleagues that we necessarily didn't get along with. But that's where, you know, you really have to take a step back and try to just define, all right, <clears throat> what is meaningful for me right now? And do I, what do I need to do to get past this so I can continue to get to where I need to go? You know, during the prep session, we had a conversation about the multi-generational workforce. And Adrian, I think you were saying there were up to five generations yes, yes. in the workforce right now. So I want to yes. go to this question here. Uh, what yes. advice would you give to someone who is maturing in age, but they want to start a new career after developing over many years? Oh, I, my, my advice would be, when I love this question because I love this topic. So yeah, there are five generations all the way from the incoming Gen Zs to even some people who are traditionalists who are older than the baby boomers because they haven't retired yet. Uh, my advice is to keep learning and learn as much as you can from the younger generations, but also embrace the wisdom that you've attained over those years. So that person who asked the question, acknowledge <clears throat> there are a lot of skills and experience that that person has, right? Continue to always um, embrace those superpowers and skills, what it, you know, whether it's leadership of skills, whether it's team building. Again, those are type of human skills that that to me, refined with age and not to discount the skills that the younger individuals may have, whether it's digital acumen, which even though boomers and Gen Xers like myself, we have digital acumen as well. But again, <laughs> just based just based on where you are in life and based on how you came of age, there are certain skills that you're closer to. But I would say for that person who's on the old season, more season experience side, continue to learn, continue to be knowledgeable of new technologies. I always try to, and especially in the lane that I'm in, encourage people who are, whether it's 40 plus, 50 plus, do not be scared of new technology. Learn about AI, learn about large language models like chat GPT. You don't have to be an expert, but be able to just speak the language and understand. Because I tell people those individuals you know, new technology, AI, digital, they're not going to replace people. They're going to replace people who don't use them. And right. so you have to, as a seasoned professional, just be open to understanding the technologies of the world, be open to learning from the youth of tomorrow, learning from Gen Z's and millennials um, and the skills that they can give you. And at the same time, 
pass on your wisdom, pass on your acumen of relationship building, because you've been in the workforce more when it was more of an interpersonal relationships um, in the past. And I would say continue to utilize that mutual learning exchange with the older and the new, and you would be, you would be fine. We're going to try to get through a few more of these questions uh, before we close out. Uh, D, I want to speak to you about this. Adrian talked about superpowers. And I think just from meeting you, one of your superpowers to me is sharing. I think you're so open with sharing. And, and, and that's a very positive skill set to have. They want to know if someone would share an antidote about a mistake, I guess a story even, about a mistake that they've made in their professional career and advocating for themselves. Anything in your wheelhouse that you can think, you know what, I probably would have done that differently. Oh, for sure. I mean, it goes back to um, early career. And so one of the things that I would say to um, the person who asked for the advice for, 20, for a 25 year old, the advice that I would have given was like, be curious and continue to be like open to learning. You may think that you've gotten to this place and space of of, I got it, but um, just be be open to learning. So when I um, finished school, I, I worked when I was in college. And so when I finished, I put together this presentation about um, for my boss, about what the market rate was for um, the role that I was in. I did all this research and I presented it. And I thought that because I had done the research that she was just gonna say yes to giving me this raise. What I did not pay attention to was whether or not the business could afford to give me the money that I was asking for. And so I think what I learned from that, because, you know, advocating for yourself and, um, you know, asking for a promotion or a raise, what I learned very early in my career is that it's contextual, right? It is only, it's only a useful ask and it's only a reasonable ask if the business can afford it if there's space for you to, just because you want a promotion doesn't mean that there's space for the promotion that you're asking for. You So I would say that that's what I learned is really to be, to understand the business that I am a part of and not just I work for someone. That was a very powerful lesson for me very early in my career because I thought just because I was doing work and people were getting paid X at other places that my boss could afford to pay me this. And so I learned that very early on. And that's the advice that I would give to anyone now, right? We talk about promotion. We talk about raise. Really be mindful of what you're asking. And I saw a question in here around, um, you know, how do you do salary uh, research? Or make yeah. sure you are looking at a company that's about your same size, right? That um, do as much research on the company as possible so that you are asking for something that's appropriate for the size of organization or the industry that you're in. If you work in the nonprofit sector, you're likely not going to make as much money as people in, um, you know, some of these big businesses. If you work in tech, you may get paid more than people who are in different industries. So I think that I learned very early in my career that advocating for myself without proper context is not going to net me the result that I'm looking for. So I think that that was something very early on that I carry with me today. Really be mindful of what you're asking for and make sure it's appropriate for the environment that you're in. Yeah, no, when I saw that salary question and uh, Taisha, listen, uh, payscale.com is a good resource. Also, uh, we did a show on salary negotiation probably a few months back. Lulu Cycli, uh, Zena, they were the guests. If you go back on the YouTube channel for the Urban League Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series, you'll see that episode. I would watch that again. I think they had some great information. All right. Well, listen, I'd like to give you guys the opportunity to share any closing remarks or tips with our audience. And Adrian, I'd start with you, sir. Uh, thank you. Well, first, uh, before I close out, I just want to thank you again, Kenneth, National Urban League, uh, my my co-partner in, in Superpowers D. Uh, it's been a great, fruitful conversation. So thank you for having me on. I would say just continue to, you know, beyond just the three pillars of always continue to, you know, reframe your mindset. Again, this is a, a, an ongoing process. I always like to say, again, mastery, whether it's mastering your career, mastering your personal life, mastering your years, is, an, is not just one final destination. It's an ongoing evolution of skill refinement, relationship building. And always continue to just, no matter where you are in your career, reframe, reimagine your mindset to think that how, I can, how can I continue to grow? whether I'm a 25 professional or still in college, whether I'm a 45 individual, whether I'm someone who's older in my 70s, I always can grow. 
and always look for meaning discovery. Always try to be on the front lines of aligning what does a purposeful career look like for me based on how I connected the dots of my past, based on the value that I always like to add. And then last but not least, continue to always set new milestones in your career, no matter if they're micro, small, or no matter if they're mac macro. Always keep that ongoing process of momentum and you will be successful. And just uh, stay on LinkedIn. <laughs> I will always <laughs> like to say, I'm a big LinkedIn fan. Big LinkedIn fan indeed. Uh, Dee, would you like to chime in, please? Uh, share some closing thoughts, uh, kind of take a dive into to what you want to share. Yep. So um, again, thank you to the National Urban League, Ken and Adrian. This has been an excellent conversation. So I would say just a few things, like continue being curious, be flexible in what your definition of success looks like. When you are thinking about how to advocate for yourself, Make sure you're making an informed ask, but that you've done the, the groundwork in advance. You've told your story, you've done the work. And so when you ask, it's going to be a no-brainer to get what you want. Um, you know, always be looking for ways to continue to grow um, because, you know, we got a long time to work, right? We want to be able to enjoy the lives that, that we are building. Um, with that, I think uh, we'll drop in the chat, you know, ways to stay connected on LinkedIn. I'm a big believer in LinkedIn as well. Um, so let's stay connected. And if anybody ever needs anything, then give me a shout. Yeah, we actually have some slides to share if you okay. want to stay connected to our panelists. And I saw a question uh, regarding if there will be a replay. Yes, of course, you can catch up with this on the Urban League Jobs Network YouTube channel and all of our past episodes as well. If you want to stay in contact with Ms. McDougal, Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Capco, you can catch her on LinkedIn. She's there, trust me, I touch her there constantly. So uh, I know she's on LinkedIn and active. If you'd like to stay connected to Mr. Adrian Porter, founder, Mid-Career Mastery, he is on LinkedIn as well. But this man is out here. Check out that podcast. Adrian, what's the name of the podcast? Uh, well, I actually have two. So I have a Gen X Amplified, if you can see back there. Um, and I also have Fabulous Over 40, which is a fireside chat series. So I, I interview, that's more of a live video um, uh, interview series that I do that I talk to individuals who are making a meaningful impact, um, who happen to be also over 40 um, at, in midlife. So, uh, so check that out. Look, I'm, I'm 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 promoting for you here. Give them the IG as well because I know you drop clips on IG. I see. Them yeah, all. yeah. You know what? I would say just follow me. I'm everywhere. Adrian Porter. I'm not using it. I'm easy peasy. Adrianporter.com. Adrian Porter on IG. Adrian Porter on LinkedIn. Um, my website Adrianporter.com. I'm I'm easy peasy. Just just follow me there. Definitely on LinkedIn. I have a Mid Career Mastery newsletter on LinkedIn as well where I'm dropping. So kind of tools and tips on how to thrive in your career. So, so check me out there. Well, listen, and I will have to say, I will have to say, so Adrian, I was trying to hold on to being early career, but you keep saying 40 and mid career. So I guess I'm about to drop that, um, drop that early and just step right on it to be in a mid career professional. Hey, look, I always say there's magic in the middle. All right. <laughs> now, we're living longer. We're living longer. So mid career, you can be, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Come on okay. in. The water's warm. The water's warm. Come on in. The water's warm indeed. Listen, we are going to do this again on November 15th. So let's go to the next slide, please. If you want to stay connected with me, LinkedIn, eastcoastexecutives.com. But let's go to the next slide. We are doing this again. I know there was a question about burnout in the Q&A. I didn't get to it, but it's okay because on November 15th, we will cover recovering from burnout. We got some get great guests for that. So once we start running the promos, you'll hear a little more about that. I know Jenny Vasquez is one of them. But uh, anyway, Recover from Burnout, November 15th. Look, on behalf of the National Urban League, I'm Kenneth L. Johnson. The team at the Urban League Jobs Network, Dory Brown, Wanda Jackson, everybody out there that makes this great each and every other week. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for just joining us. Our guest today, Adrian Porter, D. McDougall, thank you so very much. It's another show. We'll see you November 15th. Recover from burnout. Thank you. Bye.